The music was coming from within me. I was not listening to music. I kind of was the music. Welcome to the High Performance Health Podcast with your host, Angela Foster. The show where we talk about everything you need to break through limits and achieve a high performance mind, body and lifestyle. Hello, it's Angela here and welcome back to part two of my interview with Alex Manos. Um, If you haven't listened to the first part on Tuesday's episode, um, go back and have a listen to that because it's a great introduction to what we're going to be talking about today. Part one dealt with um, developing emotional, spiritual, physical and mental resilience and Alex really broke it down. Um, for the listeners. And then in today's episode, we're going to dive into the spiritual side a bit more. And Alex opens up about his experience at the um, psychedelic transformation retreat known as Synthesis in Amsterdam, which is a legal medically supervised truffle retreat center for professionals who want to experience personal growth, emotional breakthroughs, and spiritual development. And he talks about his personal experience there, why he chose to go to a legal and medically supervised center to first experiment with plant medicine. We talk about how breath work can really change your life um, with or without the use of plant medicine and also how to get into a deeper state of relaxation and meditation. So I think you're going to enjoy this episode regardless of your views on plant medicine. I think there's a lot that we can all learn here. Um, So just sit back really and enjoy. Um, so I want to dive into that because you've this is an area that you've explored more and I know you've been out to the Netherlands and you've kind of accessed a bit of that ulterior state which is really um, an, a way of accelerating that understanding isn't it and that self-understanding and you've used a bit of plant medicine to access that um, what have you found and how has that is that now translating into your life? Because I know off air you said things are never the same afterwards. Um, so can we give people a bit of background in terms of what you can do to try and access this and, and how obviously to do it in a sensible way? Yeah, so where to start? I It all started for me um, reading Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, as is often the case these days because mm-hmm. it was such a big hit. Um, and it was almost a running joke during the retreat in the Netherlands, which was um, at the Synthesis retreat. I have no affiliation, but I just praise them all day, every day now. Um, Everyone had read the book and that was one of the main reasons why people were now at the retreat. Um, And it was, we took truffles. So as we said off air, truffles um, are kind of like the mycelium of the mushroom uh, and they are legal in the Netherlands. So they're kind of legal retreats that you can attend Um, which I think is is helpful just because it makes it feel a safer space. You know, you don't have any of the kind of worry, concern, anxiety around the fact that you're doing something completely illegal in this country, for Mm -hmm. example, which for some could be quite distressing and leads to potentially a a bad trip, I guess. Um, And the main thing for all of us going there was connection. So when you do um, a psychedelic ceremony, you're often asked around what your intention is for the ceremony. And you may not, you may not have an experience that has anything to do with it. So you have to hold it lightly, but the recommendation is to go in with some form of intention. And I think for every single one of us, it was connection, Uh, either greater connection with ourselves or our loved ones, friends, the planet, nature, just generally, I think everyone was seeking greater connection. Um, And it's a... It's a two night stay. You sort of turn up Friday lunchtime. There's some drinks and you meet everyone. There's a bit of a, um, an introduction to the weekend, what to expect. There's a Q&A. Friday evening, you do some interesting exercises to start to break down some of the barriers. So there's various music, dancing, blindfolds involved, all sorts of fun. Um, and then in the morning on the Saturday before the actual psychedelic ceremony, you, there's a breathwork session. And this was my introduction to breathwork. I'd never actually done it before. And it was life-changing, just the breathwork session. So within that session, um, being qu- a little bit of context, I'm quite an introvert. Uh, I don't particularly like big groups. I much prefer one-on-one chats and just talking about deep, meaningful, fun stuff. Um, 
And we were in a group, obviously full of strangers. And I got to a point where I just could not hold it in anymore. And I was laughing hysterically. Um, I was laughing with tears. There was just this overwhelming joy that came out of me from nowhere, really. And then that moved into deep sadness at the end. And I was not, you know, ugly crying, but there were tears coming down my cheeks. And it was partly related to an awareness that this was within me just by using the breath. And I think over my 20s, I had put a lot of pressure on myself. I had been working a lot and I loved it. It was my passion, but I still probably had overdone it at times. And I think I had shut down a little bit emotionally. I think I disconnected from sort of those emotions and from being vulnerable and showing that, et cetera. And I think a lot of us do. I think it's part of conditioning in our society these days. And what it felt like for me was these were suppressed emotions, you know, a time in my life when I was experiencing huge joy, but I hadn't really let it out and shown it. And same with the sadness. And it turns out that that's generally the, consensus of what's going on when you're doing breath work or anything else like psychedelics and that's the experience you have we all have um stored emotion energy within us that is contributing to our resiliency and our physical dis-ease for example um and the reason they do the breath work is to kind of prepare you kind of it's almost discharging some of that energy before you then go into something which is potentially 10 times more powerful than what you just did mm. so it and was, what type of breath work was that that you were doing because obviously there's so many different techniques yeah so the guy who did it Sven uh, just the most beautiful guy uh, he is a Wim Hof practitioner so it wasn't um It was kind of a combination, I think. I don't think it was specifically Wim Hof per se, from what I know of Wim Hof. I think it was kind of using some of those principles with other principles. It was a little bit like transformational breath work I've done. So ultimately, it was a faster, deeper breath. Mm -hmm. And then we brought in some chanting. We were kicking our hands and feet on the ground. Um, And yeah, it was just the most incredible experience. And I say it's life-changing because since then, Breathwork has pretty much been a daily ritual for me. And I'm looking at now doing sort of some professional training to be able to become a facilitator as well. Um, So it's changed my um, direction in life ultimately. Um, And based on that experience, I thought I had some sort of expectancy around what the psychedelic ceremony would be like. And I was right. So during the psychedelic Mm -hmm. experience, it was a very, again, very emotional for me. A lot of laughter, like real, just kind of childhood laughter. You know, that completely free laughter that kids yeah. do. And, deep, just and deep really belly see. and you don't yeah. go, yeah. Like I just, you don't really see that in adults as much, no. uh, but that's what it was. And it was beautiful. Um, and obviously I could talk about this for hours, Angela. So I'm going to try and not just bore everyone to death with this, but um what was interesting for me, and I think this is maybe an important point to bring up for people who are kind of curious about doing psychedelic work and maybe haven't um, had any experience yet. My overall experience was um, that of what people call the, the death ego or ego death. So I wasn't in my body anymore. I wasn't in the room. I don't really think I was on this planet. I was in the cosmos somewhere. Um, and I remember... Um, we again mention off air around ayahuasca and there's often purging mm. involved. So um, psilocybin is slightly different in that some people will throw up, but it's not in my experience or knowledge, very common. Um, having said that after 15 minutes of consuming the truffles and it's a tea ritual. So you have a mesalin porter, you grind up your truffles, which I kind of describe to people as imagine walnuts. They're a little bit like that and nutty in taste as well. Um, you kind of grind them up, you put them into your own teapot, you put some lemon juice and a bit of ginger because some people get real nausea. So the ginger's in there as a kind of an anti-nausea um, spice. Um, and then you let that sit for 15 minutes. You go into the ceremony room and then the facilitators bring each of your teas in. You drink your tea. The music has started by this point, and then you munch on the, the sort of the truffles that are at the end of the tea. So it's kind of it's a tea slash snack, shall we say? Okay. Um, are they tasty? They, I mean, they're not unpleasant, but I wouldn't describe them as particularly pleasant either. For me, it's it's relatively neutral. Um, okay. There is definitely a bit of a nutty type 
taste I think but my taste is a bit weird so people might disagree with me there (laughs) (laughs) Um, um, and I had extreme anxiety so I actually about 15 minutes in had to get up oh wow Um, I walked into the toilet um because I actually thought I was going to throw up I had horrible nausea as well um and I had never done psychedelics before so this is all very new to me and I was in this cubicle and I was starting to panic uh the in the cubicle, there were tiles, and on the tiles, there were lizards. And the lizards decided to start walking around the walls. So I was starting So there to... are lizards on the tiles. Yes. So they're there images, anyway, normally. Of tiles. But now they're coming and, to life. And now, it's not like... and now I'm starting oh, okay. to basically Sneaky. hallucinate. <laughs> um, and I scary. remember standing in there just thinking, what have I done? You know, it's not like breath work where you can stop the breath mm. practice you were in this now and that can obviously then lead to greater anxiety and, and with hindsight it was very obvious to me that this was all about control in my life you know I'm an introvert I, I find it quite hard to um delegate like I want to do everything myself not necessarily because I want it to be perfect but just for other reasons ultimately I find it hard to pass work on to people and I think the reason why I had quite a lot of anxiety was because essentially it felt like I was losing control, which kind of I was because the world was now moving around me. Yeah. Um, so I eventually left the cubicle after any sort of maybe... But you could coordinate your hands and arms because you were saying yeah, that you sort exactly. of felt like you were in the cosmos somewhere. You could see your... Yes. Um, so okay. um, I actually have... The cosmos came later. So this was actually... Okay. I kind of gone back a little bit on myself. So at this point, I was still compass mentis to a degree um i.e i was able to leave the room i spoke to a facilitator as i came out the cubicle and she kind of just checked in on me was i okay did i want to go outside um i spoke to the founder actually for the podcast it hasn't come out yet um the founder of synthesis and he was talking about how people will have sort of sensory preferences and i'm i'm a touch guy i love hugs and all of these sorts of things and Fortunately, the facilitator maybe intuitively knew this. So she gave me a quick kind of massage. She put her hands on my shoulders and just kind of almost grounded me, I think. And then I was like, okay, look, there's nothing I can do. I'm going to have to go back in, lie down. So I went back to my mattress, put the eye mask over my eyes and tried to sort of surrender to the experience. And it took me a good half hour. I kept on taking my eye mask off, trying to come back to reality as I felt almost I was just melting into the ground but eventually did. Um, and that's when essentially I kind of, I feel like I went into the cosmos. So I remember for the next half hour, genuinely wondering if I'd had a psychiatric breakdown because I didn't, I just, I was not in my body anymore. I, I don't know how else to describe it apart from that. Um, so I was in a black space ultimately. Um, the music for me was just phenomenal. So there's, there's one speaker that is played into the room. So we're all listening to the same music. But my experience, and this is really common of psychedelics, it was that the music was coming from within me. I was not mm-hmm. listening to music. I kind of was the music. And the oh, music wow. often changes the um, kind of the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The architecture, the structure of the world that you're in. So your world, you know, at some points you might be in some sort of temple, for example, so there's, um, there was a, a moment when I was, I wasn't in a room, but there were kind of bars, think of maybe Tetris almost, and the bars were moving to the music. It's the only way I can describe it. Um, and it's a beautiful experience because like nothing else I've experienced, you were submerged in this kind of auditory, sensory experience, like nothing else before. Um, can you feel the vibration of the music? Does it use a lot of kind of drums? Can you feel the no, vibration through you? There no, but there is a part when the facilitators are coming round with um, and doing basically sound healing. So they were using instruments and you could 100% feel the vibrations of the instruments they were using. Um, so there is the great thing with synthesis is it's very medical based. So the reason why I chose it or partly chose it was because my wife was quite anxious of me doing it because um, she has no experience. You know, people worry about obviously Mm. your loved one having a bad trip and having the psychotic break and all of these sorts of things that you kind of read about. Um, And there's a medical person on site at all times. The facilitators are incredibly experienced. And the general, quite frankly, like branding, et cetera, of it was just, it resonated with us. 
Um, and they combine kind of the, the, the medical aspect of things. They're actually partnered with the Imperial College in London who do a lot of the psychedelic research. So they take some of the, that kind of clinical side of things and they combine it with the spiritual sort of shamanistic or shamanism elements of psychedelic ceremonies. So you get the best of both worlds. Um, but going back to the idea of connection and something to be mindful of, I think, with these experiences is I experienced the exact opposite. So I experienced the ego death. I experienced being completely disconnected from my body. I experienced basically worrying about having a psychedelic breakdown. I remember thinking, oh, you know, is the doctor now standing over me trying to bring me back? Um, <laughs> while at the same time, kind of being weirdly okay with this because I was just in this beautiful space where I was no, it's Dr. Joe Dispenza's thing, you know, I was no one, no thing, no body, nowhere. Um, and it really strengthened my beliefs around energy medicine and this idea that, you know, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm. There is so much more that we can comprehend. Um, so my, my intention was connection, but I was having these concerns of how am I ever going to get back to my bedroom that night? How am I going to get on a plane tomorrow? How am I going to see my family again? What's going on? <laughs> um, am I lost? And, you know, it, it's almost as if, am I actually ever going to make it back into my body? Am I going to become exactly. a physical being again? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it didn't take me very long after that ceremony. I'm talking maybe half an hour for me to go. How long was the ceremony? Uh, about six hours in total. Oh, wow. So you're out um, in this state, this altered state. I, I was out in that state, I would say, for probably an hour i would say at a guess you know time obviously is one of those things that goes out the window when you're there so it, mm. it's hard to know for sure but it certainly wasn't the full six hours um so i experienced kind of disconnection so i think you know that there's a saying which is the plant medicine will give you what you need not what you want so i wanted connection i experienced complete disconnection mm that allowed me to then have huge appreciation and gratitude for the connection that I had in life that I just was not appreciating to the level that I could, which is a great relationship with my wife, a really amazing family, really good friends that I can speak with and be authentic with, et cetera. It was all already there. So rather than the plant medicine giving me kind of greater connection, I think it, it took me away from all of that completely as a way to then appreciate what already was there. And that's my interpretation of that experience, basically. Mm. Um, and, you know, again, people always talk about this idea of it will give you what you need and that plant medicine has an intuitive healing capacity to it. And it sounds very woo-woo, but speak to anyone, I think, who's done high-dose psychedelic work and there's this overwhelmingly strong belief that once you've experienced it, there is truth to those sorts of statements. And I think the only way is to experience it to be able to fully understand to whatever degree we can understand these things um that that's kind of what's going on um so it's and how has that come back now in your current mm. life like have you brought you're saying like you feel that disconnection has made you feel more connected to your wife and your family but do you feel different now could you yeah. can you access that state a bit more on demand like is it easier to meditate um I think if I'm being really honest, there were a few things. So immediately after the ceremony, um, I was certainly way more in tune with my emotions. I remember being on the plane home, listening to some songs. And actually I put on this, one of the songs from our wedding and I was just in tears. Um, and I'm certainly still a little bit more emotional. I can cry at films. I can cry in a TV program and things like this. Um, but I'd be lying if I said that some of my old habits haven't come back in. You know, I think that's um, very common and to be expected. But what I am, am still kind of integrating to some degree, and this is why I'm, I'm now going down the breathwork sort of facilitator route, is the integration is, is, the, is the most important part. So people talk about sort of um, the sort of the, the ceremony itself and the integration afterwards and the preparation before. 
So from a, a traditional perspective, there are certain things you do to prepare for a psychedelic ceremony. And that's, for example, not drinking, not smoking, not eating animal products um, is kind of the, the traditional way to go about it. So it's a bit of a, a traditional sort of detox, shall we say, before you then go and use the plant medicine. You have the ceremony and then there's the integration phase, which ultimately can go on for months, depending on, I guess, the magnitude of that experience that you had. And integration is is the hardest part. So even though I had the anxiety, the nausea, the death of my ego, etc., I still think the hardest part is coming back to a world that is so far from how humans are designed to exist. And you come back with all of these realizations about the truth. And this is very hard, I think, to explain. And I'll try and touch on it in a second. But you come back to a life that it may be a little bit incompatible to what you want your life to now be and what you think it kind of needs to be to be a really vibrant, true, authentic human being um, who is essentially a spirit and a soul. So that is something that is ongoing. And I think without wanting to make assumptions, I sometimes think having spoken to a few people who are who are really scared about doing psychedelics, like they just do not want to go there, is the more stuck you feel in your current life, my, my thought is probably the more challenging that integration may be. Because if you don't feel that you're able to start to make some changes, you're going to go and have this incredible experience and have some realizations about the truth of the universe, etc. But then not have not be able to change how you live your life around that. And this is why resiliency, spiritual, emotional, and mental, I think are so important because we all have a degree of agency over our lives, even if that's down to where we're placing our attention to begin with. So I think it's a really important thing to appreciate and to read up on and to get ready for because it is not an easy thing um, to go and have a high dose experience and then just go back to your normal existence. Um, and obviously a lot of people are doing these experiences because they know something's not quite right in their life. There's a, there might be just this gnawing feeling that something's not right. And I think that's maybe what it was for me. Um, but you need to be able to then integrate and you may need to get some support from uh, a psychotherapist or someone like that, especially ideally who's got experience with altered states of consciousness, who can just help navigate you through the challenges that come up. And for me, the thing that's come out of it is the importance of these other routes for altered states of consciousness, ultimately. So the breath work, the meditation, the creativity, learning a little bit more about flow states and how I might be able to tap into that. What are my flow states? So I know that lecturing is a great way for me to get into flow. I feel very present. I feel my higher self comes out and I'm very much in that moment to not thinking about um, anything other than what I'm talking about. Ultimately. Oh, that's interesting you say that because I find that presenting, like, so if I'm more, I'm starting to do more and more video content for people for um, social is when I'm, if I think about, if you forget what you think you should be saying, and then you think about what you want to just share with people, it flows through you, right? Mm -hmm. There's a very different thing. And you can connect, because I didn't used to think this would be possible. How can you connect with somebody that you don't know that's on the other side of effectively a screen, you don't even know when they're going to consume it. But there seems to be this incredible connection that's almost like divine intervention of you want to share this, you feel, I don't like the word passion because it almost comes from pain, but somehow you want to impart that or share. I guess it's the sharing experience, mm. isn't it? And that human connection. Um, yeah, which I think, have you looked at um, Vishen Bakiani's work on, he wrote The Code of the Extraordinary Mind. Ooh, no. um, he's now got a new book, The Buddha and the Badass. He's the founder of Mind Valley. And in okay. The Code of the Extraordinary Mind, he talks about humanism. So it's kind of coming away from religious doctrine and looking at spirituality in terms of the human race. And I think he estimates something like one billion, so a seventh of the world now is more humanistic and into humanism. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, really interesting. Um, I'll definitely check other it things, out. Yeah, have a look at it. The other thing I was, I um, and he does a beautiful meditation that you can download actually on the app for free, where it's a six phase meditation that he takes okay. you through. And one of the most amazing things is that you begin 
by thinking about who, like how you alight. So it's, you imagine someone in front of you that you love. And then from there, you imagine you color them with this love. And then you take that color and you color everyone in the house, every plant, animal, person. And then you expand it from your town. And then you color, in our case, the whole of the United Kingdom and then the world and then the universe. And then you move through these phases of gratitude, forgiveness. And sometimes that's about forgiving yourself. It's a really, I think, <laughs> post that experience you've had, you might enjoy it, actually. It's, yeah. it's an interesting one. Um, there's another thing I did that, you know, that human connection, I went to one of their events back in February, just before lockdown. And one of the things we had to do was to stand opposite someone and look into their eyes. Mm -hmm. And at first, wow, that was uncomfortable, right? So I was like, wanting to look away, wanting to, you almost feel like you're sharing yourself. Yeah. And when you go beyond that and you just look inside, you see so much beauty, you go beyond the physical self. And you kind of experience, I don't think you see, you feel that person for who they are. And then they feel you. And afterwards, you just, you can't do it now with COVID. You just have this amazing hug and you've just completely connected with that person. It's just incredible. And at first you are shifting, you're uncomfortable, right? Because it's like, this is weird. We're looking into each other's eyes because you're too physical. You're too much matter, right? At that yeah. point. And then you transcend that. And it's just the most beautiful experience because you experience the other side of humanity in a way. Mm. And the ego, as you say, is gone. Um, you mentioned there the ego dissolves, right? Is this, when you say this, what do you mean? Because you said you'd come back to it. Is this judgment, judgment of yourself? What's happened there? You know what? I, I actually forget what the sort of true definition is, but it's essentially, it is the dissolution of you as you know yourself so it's for me it was certainly that I had no boundaries you know I wasn't sort of skin and bone I was I was energy I was everything and anything and everyone and the one the the peak of the experience for me was actually this is going to sound very extreme but when I was in that sort of cosmos there was a, a time when I heard someone else in the ceremony laugh. And then I had, it was like the penny drops and it's going to sound very basic and very silly, but it was this realization that we are all from the same place, whatever you want to call that place. Mm. And basically we're all a projection and we're all wearing a mask. We're all playing a role that, our parents, our family, our upbringing, society has placed upon us ultimately. And I was laughing hysterically at this point. It was, it was this felt sense that you can't describe or articulate properly, but it was this profound realization that, you know, that's the truth of reality, the universe, whatever you want to call it. And it is the only way that we can make sense of it. We need structure and we need order. And that is what we see and that is what we call the universe and the world. But there is something far beyond that, which is the real truth. And I can't describe it. <laughs> but it was this experience that was so profound and so moving. And this is one of the reasons why I think the research shows that People who have had these mystical experiences is another term that researchers use for this. They have a greater connection afterwards, which lasts potentially for over a year. So people feel more connected to nature. They feel more connected to mankind. Uh, political views change in studies that have been done on people who have done high dose psychedelics. Um, our outlook changes because you've had these experiences which are so profound there is no way of going back to the normal way of looking at things mm. um, unless and I will put a caveat in there because I have in certain ways I have and this is why I feel that I need you know I'm being called to go and do it again ultimately um, because I think certain habits are so entrenched in our neurology that one ceremony isn't enough to fully dissolve it. Going back maybe to this idea of allostatic loads and allostasis mm. really, how entrenched is that habit or belief? How long has that been serving you? 
And um, a lot of the books I've read around psychedelics talk about this. Sometimes two, three, four high dose sessions may be required. Um, and synthesis, since I went, have actually now come up with a five day retreat where you do a low moderate dose ceremony on day two. And I think day four is then a high dose, um, which I think would be for someone like me, maybe incredibly powerful because it's just giving you a greater opportunity to break some of those hardwired habits that um, might just be holding you back from being that kind of true higher version of yourself ultimately. Um, but for me, again, that's where things like the breath work come into it. So I think you even used the word Angela earlier, sort of catalyst. So people will say how, you know, med you can reach these states through meditation. You can, if you're going to meditate for hours a day for 10 years, it would be my response. And that's just not practical. So for me, and the way I think about psychedelics is they are a catalyst. They are a way to, within sort of half an hour, experience some of those experiences, which a Tibetan monk who's been meditating for most of their life may be experiencing. Um, so I think that's one of their kind of powers, ultimately. That's why they certainly appeal to some people, because it's a way to have these experiences and to tap into that spiritual side, energetic side of things. Um, but it's not necessarily easy. Mm. And it definitely requires doing your homework beforehand, I think would be my response. And I know people will have different opinions there. Uh, there was someone on the retreat who had done nothing. They knew nothing, hadn't read the books that oh, had been wow, recommended. Really? Nothing, they just, they up. just showed up. Uh, and they <laughs> had a university student <laughs> <laughs> after a long bending I, I, Ironically, <laughs> actually, he was probably the oldest of them. Oh, really? Interesting. But he, um, you know, he had a challenging beginning to his experience, but he had a beautiful experience overall. And ultimately, often it's those most challenging experiences which turn out to be the most profound and healing of, as, mm. of, as is often the case with these sorts of things. Um, Have you played with getting up really early um, in the morning and meditating at that point? So I know Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about it mm. and that you can access the pineal gland while the melatonin is still high. But I find that um, particularly if you're someone that wakes up and you're kind of like, right, what do I need to do? And you're too much in thought mode. And the moment you've kind of used the bathroom, brushed your teeth, checked your phone, you mustn't do that. People, <laughs> listeners, don't do it. Put it off for at least an hour and a half. Um, but if actually you meditate still in your night work, right? So you're still really kind of sleepy and you use the breath work first to slip into it. I found that you can get into that deep relaxation, particularly if you're doing kind of TM where you're using a mantra, you can really access that. And you're kind of in that, that state between wakefulness and sleepiness, but it is a, I suppose the closest, right? I don't know, because I haven't done plant medicine yet to that altered state and that deep sense of relaxation. Mm, interesting. What sort of time are we talking about? No, do I don't think it even needs to be that early. I'm quite an early riser anyway. But I found that even getting out of bed, I think the trick is that when what I found is when you wake up, the temptation is to allow yourself to fully wake up before you get out of bed. Because I don't want people to injure themselves. But um, so I just put that caveat. <laughs> but, um, you're kind of in that state where you're like, I'll come round. And unfortunately, if you do lie in bed for another five or 10 minutes, you may hit the snooze button or more likely you're probably going to get this spiking cortisol of like I need to get going what have I got to do mm. if you catch before then so you're still quite drowsy and sleepy and you come out of bed and or you can even do it in bed and but there's a danger you'll fall asleep there and then meditate somewhere really quiet and somewhere that's away from things you normally do I find going into a room that you don't normally do stuff in so you don't right. work you don't work out you don't there's nothing active that you do in that room you can slip into it and obviously it's amazing when you can yeah. um yeah i've done um for six months i did i was i started meditating at six and i did a half hour meditation and that was every day really for six months and and that definitely changed me you mm. know i'd be lying i i with my meditation practice i i must admit i i fluctuate a bit so i can be consistent for up to six months but then i can have sort of two months without doing any um but I'm also now a fan of being flexible with some of these things, going back to this mm. idea of flexibility. So I like, um, oh, who was it? Tim Ferriss, I think, 
I read an article of his once and he kind of commented on, you know, he has five things and if he does three of them, it's a good morning. Yeah, I agree. So there's the cold shower, there's the meditation, there's the journaling, there's the reading. And I think he had one other one in there. Um, and he'll pick based on how he's feeling on that day. And I quite like that sort of fluidity within it. So you've always got something, um, but you can kind of adapt based on what you feel intuitively might be most helpful. Um, but going back to what you were talking about with the melatonin and the meditation side of things, it, it resonates a little bit. I'm really into lucid dreaming at the moment. Oh, are you? I've been reading Charlie Morley's books. And if anyone's uh, not familiar with his work or maybe not familiar with lucid dreaming even, uh, his books are brilliant. Uh, I think he's a really good writer at just making things kind of light and playful and fun, but while still talking about some quite cool stuff. Um, and he talks about waking up um, sort of early. And that might be sort of really two hours before your normal wake up time. So let's say between um, four and five or four and six, maybe depending on when someone wakes up, um, because you have a greater likelihood of then falling back into a lucid dream um, for reasons that I can't quite remember. But the, some of the research and certainly anecdotal evidence around lucid dreaming from a healing perspective is, is phenomenal. Um, and it's a re I think it's a really exciting area that there should be way much more kind of attention placed upon because it falls in with kind of what we're talking about, you know, this idea of energy and psychedelics or meditation and just generally being your optimal self. So the book I'm reading at the moment is on, on, it's on shadow work. So the shadow of us being the parts that we are suppressing, essentially. And interestingly, what I didn't realize until I read the book is it's not just the stuff that you might feel shame and embarrassment about yourself, but it's also what he calls the golden shadow, which is kind of your higher self, you know, that complete and utter power that we do have within ourselves that for various reasons we might be scared to step into. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. So you're almost stepping into the best version of yourself. Exactly. Wow. So the shadow until then, I had always sort of read around it being kind of the dark side. You know, it's mm. the scared of, it's the shame, it's the embarrassment. Uh, you know, Charlie does an amazing job of um, commenting on some of his, his shadow stuff. And that included, you know, he occasionally watches porn, for example. Um, he really kind of goes very vulnerable and raw around it. But what I didn't appreciate was there is the golden shadow and that is you at your highest potential. And there are things that probably scare you about that. And there certainly are things that um, I've kind of journaled around that kind of make me scared of that kind of golden shadow and fully stepping into my higher self and my true potential and what that means. And I think, and this is a personal reflection that I wonder whether it's a common one, which is, it's the same thing with psychedelics for me, which is if you do eventually step into that golden shadow, what does that mean for your life up until that point? You know, is there going to be any kind of regret oh. that it's like, oh my God, it's taken me 36 years to realize this. Kind of, yeah, maybe a little yeah. bit of disappointment. And again, that's where the self-compassion, the mindfulness, the kind of being light and playful with all of these serious topics, I think becomes really important. Um, but I do wonder whether, you know, what I was saying about how stuck do you feel in life? And if you did a psychedelic ceremony, would you feel that you have the capacity to navigate that and make the changes required? It's the same thing with stepping into your higher self. What does that mean for you and your life as it is right now? What does that mean for you and your job? Are you going to be able to quit and, and go into self-employment or whatever it is that comes up for you? Um, are you going to feel alienated from your family members? You know, there's all sorts of stuff that can happen when you go down these paths mm -hmm. and you hear it all the time. People who then struggle with the relationship they're in that has to end because there's just a huge mismatch now from an energetic perspective almost about where these two individuals are going in life. So do yeah. you feel confident that you've got the resources that you can go in the same direction together? And that's a conversation that I think is important to have with your partner. Um, before going into these sorts of experiences, you know, are they on boards? Are they kind of, do they have the same outlook and trajectory for their lives, et cetera? Um, because, you know, I spoke to Richie Bostock, who um, is a breath guy, known as the breath guy on social media. Um, and he's, you know, he's experienced it facilitating breathwork sessions with people, whereas it's, it's basically ended relationships, it's ended careers and all sorts of other things because of the realizations that come up, you know, they're not living 
their true life. And ultimately we all want to, it's whether we have the courage and slash vulnerability to, to step into that space. Well, it's interesting you say that actually, because um, I'm doing, I wanted to learn to meditate on my own. So I've always done guided meditations. And so um, I've been doing the course by Emily Fletcher um, and she teaches you to meditate for 15 minutes twice a day. And she has this 3M technique where you do uh, mindfulness first and there's some breath work and then you move into the meditation with a mantra and then you come out and it's silent meditation and then you come out into manifestation. And she makes it quite clear at the opening of the course, um, you need to basically suspend these next few weeks and not make any major decisions in your life at all. Mm. So that whether that's good or bad. So there's no proposals don't ask someone to marry you, which I thought was funny. And, and, and definitely don't break up with anyone either, right? So there's no divorce and there's no proposals and don't change jobs, don't do anything because you almost yeah. need to let the dust settle. But I guess what you're saying, particularly with a, a plant-based experience, is it could be so profound that you suddenly make that. Yeah, and it's a good point because the synthesis say the exact same thing, actually. I feel like that's a good point to make, which is they also say, do not make any profound decisions on the back of this ceremony. Give yourself six, nine months. Um, process oh, wow, it, long. integrate it. And then, you know, if you still feel that's the right decision, then go for it. Um, so they also actually said that at the beginning, um, which I, I think, think is a really good come point. come over time, don't they, as well, as you say, like mm. six, nine months. I know I, interestingly, my experience of kind of how I, I suppose, access that ulterior space, and, and listeners might get bored with this. They've probably heard me say it before. <laughs> but when I was in um, hospital with pneumonia and I was very, very sick, the fevers were so high that that actually, so I, if you imagine I, having suffered with clinical depression and I was on bipolar medication, it wasn't really working. I had wanted to end my life and thought about that so many times that almost my physical health, I think, deteriorated as if well, you've, you've asked for this. Here you go. This is what you wanted, isn't it? Right. And, you know, I, I was neutropenic. I had viral and bacterial pneumonia and really antibiotics wow. when it's viral and bacterial probably isn't enough. And when they came in I and, and explained all that to me, I was just so sick that I actually felt peace. And I think it was that lucid state that you're talking about there that you can access when you're in a deep fever. And for me, it was just peace that I felt. Mm -hmm. And then gratitude and this sense of wanting to be a part of my children's life. So there had been this um, kind of quite a severe juxtaposition, I guess, where I'm on my own in hospital. I'd been trying to run away only from myself. And here I am with just me because my kids, I couldn't say goodbye to. I, they thought I had lung cancer initially. So when I arrive at the hospital wow. and have the scans, I was then told I couldn't go home. So my kids got <laughs> home from school, not knowing where mommy is. And I couldn't leave the hospital. So that was a real like profound experience. Mm. It's like, all of a sudden, I can't say goodbye to them. I'm not in part of their life. They're going to have to come and visit me. And my brother <laughs> turned up at the hospital. He drove <laughs> like... 60 or 80 miles to see oh. me. And I was like, I'm close to my brother, but not that close. Do you know what I mean? We speak not that often. And I was like, Dan, what are you doing here? And he goes, I don't know. I just saw something on Sky News that said people can die of pneumonia. So I thought oh. I'd better pitch up in case. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, that puts you in perspective. At least it was lighthearted. But it was that juxtaposition of thinking, I just want to get away from me. I want to run away from me. But actually now I'm detached, disconnected. Like you were talking with the psychedelic. I'm now disconnected from my family and stuck with just me. But in that moment, I did feel peace. And that was the big shift. And it sounds very woo-woo, but that's what turned it around. But I think it's taken, you know, that's like five or six years ago, over time, that experience. And maybe because I pay attention to the things you've been talking about. I mm. practice gratitude, practice, I keep coming back to it. The one thing I can't get, and I love your tips on this before you go, is journaling for me. That is just that's too raw. I find that hard. Okay. I don't, I get these beautiful books, you know, and these <laughs> journals and I go, right, I'm going to get into journaling. And it's almost like, I don't want to like, I don't want to disrupt the pages. It looks too nice. <laughs> so I just stream of consciousness. Like, is that just me that feels that way? Or is journaling actually a really big step? I think journaling and the research shows this is huge for people. Um, and even just freestyle, you know, an empty blank mm. bit of A4 um, and just put pen to paper, start, don't think about it. Um, and that's been shown to be very therapeutic from a physical, emotional, spiritual, mental perspective. 
Um, but I agree, it's not necessarily easy. And I think it's probably one of those things that does require a little bit of um, sort of training. You know, there are, there are sort of, um, what's his name? Eric Cressy is someone who I follow on Instagram who has like an online course that partly involves um, journaling ultimately. And he's a kind of, I'm not quite sure how he describes himself, but he's kind of like a Jungian psychotherapist type guy. So he's quite big on the archetypes of things like the king, warrior, magician, lover for masculinity and things like this. Um, and I've done different ones over the years. So <clears throat> my journaling started with just a five minute journal, which a lot of people- I like that. I like That's that. a really nice entry level, well, I think really pretty well-designed book mm -hmm. um, where you're doing two and a half minutes in theory in the morning and the evening. Um, and I have had clients where that's had profound changes to their mental well-being. Um, so for some, it really is enough. Um, I've used that's the gratitude, isn't it? Where you do it in yeah, the morning and then in the evening, look at what's gone well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's just mm -hmm. literally ask you, I think, two questions in the morning, two questions in the evening. And, yeah. and as you say, in the morning, list three things you're grateful for today. Um, and the great thing with that is there is an email series you can sign up to, which helps you fulfill or complete the journal. Because what a lot of people find, myself included, is you kind of just start writing the same stuff. And mm. there's a lack of emotional connection to it. And it becomes more of almost like an academic exercise of, oh, I'm grateful for my coffee this morning. That will do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, you know, it's really important to, to tap into that emotional side of, you know, what are you genuinely feeling grateful for? Not what are you thinking that you're grateful for? And that's, again, where things like heart map, I think, can be quite powerful to tap into the heart, not the brain, because we're all in our heads all the time mm. as it is. Um, then I then I used the the daily greatness journal, which at first felt really overwhelming, but I actually absolutely loved it. Um, and I stopped using it last year just because I'd had enough. I used it for a couple of years, and and that's a pretty uh, chunky journal. It includes like a year planner. It breaks it down into three month um, sections, and you set your three month goals. Um, it, there's a wheel of life exercise, so you can kind of rank yourself out of 10 for different areas of life like spirituality and finances and you can work towards it so it's quite a nice way of mm. uh, structuring your year from that perspective they also do like a business daily greatness journal and a yoga one and things like this um, and then during lockdown I actually just had a blank blank journal and I just journaled I streamed my thoughts for 20 minutes a day um, and there was some look at it or yeah, so I did some journaling around my synthesis retreats as well. And I, I do actually find that that's the most therapeutic part for me, going back and reading what was going on and what was I struggling with. And you start, I think, to sometimes realize, oh, I'm, I don't struggle with that anymore. I, I am making progress. <laughs> um, so it can be nice to kind of reflect back on what was going on because you all know, Angela, I think we get so accustomed sometimes to our way of living and sometimes mm -hmm. the symptoms you know how many clients do we get who who often say you know they didn't realize how bad they were feeling until they got better because it happened over so many years that that kind of gradual decline in health that they didn't notice that they weren't feeling themselves anymore because that was their new norm mm, um, set point change didn't it yeah that's exactly um so that's where i think journaling can be really great and it's that sort of retrospective going back into the journal six months ago and saying, okay, what was going on in my internal landscape then that I've forgotten about? And have I actually overcome that now? And that can be really rewarding and quite, um, quite empowering. Mm, that's inspired me to have a, have a look. I tried and it's just something I haven't kept up with. I, Cause I'm the same as you. I love the Tim Ferriss approach of having these things that I tick off and mm. I don't do them all every morning. And I don't think being rigid is a good thing where you have to do that thing every day. It's a bit like exercise, right? I like so many modalities of exercise. Um, but the journaling is the one that probably for me just seems to be the hardest. And I think it's because maybe I'm not being, I don't know, somehow I can't be fully honest um maybe it's kind of mm. like yeah but I guess it's staring you then isn't it in the face in a way yeah it's it's tricky I think I I, I didn't find sort of freestyle journaling necessarily easy to begin with and I definitely found an interesting thing for me I guess was I found I was coming back to the same thing which was kind of a bit of a red flag in its own right <laughs> but you know okay. what am I not what am I not actually processing or dealing with here if I'm continually coming back to the same theme um that's 
a pretty good bit of evidence that I need to actually address something here. Um, yeah. So that was quite, quite helpful. Um, but I do think it's a matter of sometimes practice um, and having a coach, someone who's kind of maybe, or a mentor is maybe even a better term, someone who's ahead of you in that process, who might be able to give you a bit of wisdom and insight. Um, I have a, an old client who is now sort of a colleague, but certainly a very good friend. And we speak weekly and kind of help each other out. It's almost a mutual coaching call. Um, and that proves incredibly powerful for both of us in regards to how we're moving forward week by week and what our objectives are and what we're both struggling with. And it's a really, it's one of my favorite hours of the week ultimately. And that's kind of what we need more of that. Mm. So, so you're back, kind of coaching each other, are you? Yeah, exactly. We are. Um, and it works really well. You know, he's really into, um, sort of masculinity now so he's working towards becoming a bit of a masculinity coach mentor educator and doing kind of men's work and things like this so he kind of brings that lens to to it so i'll tell him something i'm struggling with and he'll have a, just a sometimes a really meaningful insight that i can take away and then reflect on um, but going back quickly before we um if we're coming to the end around what you mentioned with you know how has my life changed Mm. But I think my professional life is changing with the way how I kind of just show up from that perspective. You know, the conversations I have and what I think is probably the most meaningful elements of health, which is not the physical side of things for a lot of at least my client base. Normally, there's there is trauma in their in their life story. And, you know, for those of your listeners who haven't yet, I can't recommend enough going and looking at some of the work by the likes of Gabor Mate and Peter Levine which show us how trauma, especially in early life, oh, yeah. often manifests in physical disease later on. And until we've actually processed and integrated that trauma, we're never going to be that sort of whole vibrant person that we want to be. Uh, and there's an amazing book called The Fellowship of the River, which is all about ayahuasca. It's a medical doctor from America who went out to the Amazon for a few years, uh, set up a, a place down there. And there are case studies that he's put into the book from ulcerative colitis, I think, or it's one inflammatory bowel disease, uh, psoriasis, PTSD and trauma. Uh, I think there's one on eczema, depression, like some slightly outside the box things, certainly with things like the psoriasis. And the stuff that was coming up during those psychedelic ceremonies was often around childhood traumas and, and family dynamics and all of these stresses that have a massive impact on the, what he describes as the energy, I think he calls it the emotional body, this idea of psychoneuroimmunology, our mind and our emotions that are intimately connected. And in fact, I'm doing a, a lecture next month on the mind-body connection. And one of the things, I uh, stumbled across a paper introducing the term affective immunology. And it is this area of research that is basically looking at the fact that our emotions and our immune system are almost mirrors of one another and they are intimately connected. And this is why, unless we're also paying attention to our emotional well-being and what's going on in our emotional worlds, we can never necessarily, well, it's possible, let's say, that you're never going to be able to get that really resilient, healthy immune system because of how interconnected these are. And what psychedelics can do is they can bring stuff up to the surface for us. And many people would have heard this idea that it's a famous quote that I'm not going to get quite right, but it's along the lines of one dose of psychedelics is worth the 10 years of psychotherapy because we're not talking through the trauma. We're not rehashing it and returning to it. We are, we are accessing it from a completely different perspective. And part of that, in my experience at least, was related to the felt sense. It's almost that somatic therapy. Uh, the fact that if we really want to overcome trauma and turn post-traumatic um, trauma into post-traumatic growth, as the term says, then there has to be a body energetic component to it. Because some of what Galamate says is trauma is basically energy that wasn't discharged at the time of the traumatic event. And that energy gets stored in our nervous system and leads to states of dis-ease and disequilibrium within the body that then manifest in disease somehow. Um, and until you mobilize and discharge that energy, 
you're never going to really deal with the underlying issue that's driving that pathology. So just did he write the body keeps the score? As well? Yeah. yeah. Uh, did he keep the body? Keeps he, the, I know. I think that's Van de, that's that Van de Kolk or I th- yeah, another author in the, okay. the same field. Yeah. Basically. That's another great book on this, on this topic. And one of uh, my final point on this is one of the things I've experienced more with breath work. I have, don't think I've experienced with psychedelics is it's just whole body shaking. At the, uh, often at, towards the beginning of yeah. sessions where I feel like I'm on like a vibrating platform. I can, you can see my body shaking as if I was, I just had a, I don't know, a car accident or some sort of trauma because it goes back to this idea that when there's trauma, the fight or flight response, if you look at an animal in nature, if it survives that fight or flight response from the tiger, whatever it may be, you will see it shake. It is discharging the energy that was flooded into the system to help it survive the life or death situation. For humans, we often don't do that. And in fact, during Peter Levine's experience with the paramedic, he was told not to move at all. So we're even in certain situations told to do the exact opposite of what we need to do to make sure that that event doesn't become a traumatic event where we end up with PTSD. So this idea of discharging energy can happen in many ways but breath work and somatic work touch therapy yoga therapy um there are now systems and exercises that the likes of peter levine have created to help us discharge this kind of energy uh, that people can get trained in and that's it's, interesting because if you don't really the ever um it's really exciting if you ever like i've got a rebounder behind me in the office and obviously we've got a trampoline with the kids in the garden but when you go on that if you just jump up and down and really kind of shake out your wrists and and just kind of do this, it feels so you're not just bouncing, but as you say, you're shaking at the same time because dogs do it, don't they? Right? Mm-hmm. Often they'll do something and they oh, big big shake and almost just let it go. Yeah, um, it feels incredible. But did you, with your psychedelic experience, then did you? Did, did things kind of leave you then? Because what you're really talking about there is there's a difference between when you're doing therapy, there's always a danger, isn't there, that you trip into rumination because you keep revisiting and then you revisit it on your mm. own. And I think when I was depressed, actually, I did that. I think rumination was a big problem. I kept without, yeah. initially, I didn't know. And as you say, you always got to bring the awareness first. I didn't know I was doing it. Um, but with the psychedelic experience, is that energetic exchange then? Does it sort of leave the body? I think it can do. Um, I mean, I don't think it's probably quite the same sort of mechanisms, but I remember a really profound ex- um, experience. It wasn't, it wasn't at synthesis. This was a later psychedelic experience, but I had this sort of moment where I felt like I had become almost like a vacuum, I guess, like from an energetic perspective. I felt like I had, I had felt my energetic being, for want of a better expression. And there was this peace and stillness and discharge of energy that came from it. So I think it, I think it can happen maybe through a slightly different means. So you're not necessarily shaking and and discharging energy that way, but there could be, there could be a physical, but there's certainly going to be an emotional and maybe an energetic sort of thing, because you've probably seen some of the research around what's going on in the brain during psychedelic experiences. And, you know, that default mode network, which is associated with our sense of self and rumination, for example, it shuts down during psychedelic experiences. And Michael Pollan talks about shaking the snow globe. You know, you're really mixing things up within that brain. And they've shown that during psychedelic experiences, there are parts of the brain that are now communicating with one another, which in normal states of consciousness aren't. So there's this huge branching out of neurological communication that takes place. And that some people I think suspect is one of these reasons why we get this completely different state of consciousness and reality. This is why we see lizards moving through the walls. And when we go off into the cosmos and we kind of see what's out there, that's not, normally within our lens of perception as a human being mm. um so when we go back to the idea of rumination yeah psychedelics can massively break that and one of the most powerful short-term things i found was uh some habits completely disappeared and some of them have started to come back so for example i back then i had a tendency I was a bit of a grazer at that point in time, actually. I kind of, there was definitely some emotional stress snacking going on at certain times. 
And post that weekend, that completely and utterly disappeared. And I didn't even, I wasn't aware of it initially. And then one day that I kind of go, oh yeah, you know, I'm not, that behavior is completely and utterly changed. I have no idea why, apart from we know that psychedelics, certainly psilocybin is working on the serotonin system within the body. And maybe there's kind of something going on from that perspective. Um, but there are those kind of behaviors that can change like that change. and depending on your integration process some will start to come back if you're not integrating um uh, for, for one of a better expression is maybe as efficiently or as effectively as you could be um because again you know we're only we're only able to process what we're willing to process we all mm. have massive blind spots um and this has been a big thing for me over the last nine months is this understanding that uh, we're so in our story of who we are in this world that we're completely blinded by it because we're seeing reality as, as reality. And we kind of forget that actually this is just our reality. It's our filter that we're putting on based on our experiences, our trauma, our values, our beliefs, our upbringing. And it is a way to stay safe. I think going back to this idea, we need these stories for structure and, and order to some degree. Because what happens if we start to fully accept and realize that actually this is all a story and this isn't really what's going on. And we're all wearing a mask and oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Who the hell am I? Exactly. And that's something that I have struggled with a little bit. It's like, it's hard to articulate properly, but it's this idea of, well, you know, who am I or who do I want to be if I'm not mm. actually who I think I am? Um, and is that just this huge limiting belief that I'm putting on myself that I can't be that person, that I can't go and do that? And you can start to question an awful lot. And I think that's where it's important to sometimes come back to the concept that we're a human being, have, we're a spiritual being having a human experience. Mm -hmm. and, and it is part of the solution, just getting stuck into the human experience is the way I think about it, you know. Because I, it sounds very basic and silly, but there have been times over the years where I've been like, "Well, if I'm a really spiritual person, should I have a TV? You know, should I should I be doing that? Um, <laughs> should I be into like you know rugby if I'm spiritual?" Um, and you can kind you're going to ditch the phone and everything else exactly. and put your sandals on or just Live get barefoot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's something that you know I have to joke about at times because it it sometimes has been a bit like, "Oh, I just don't know." But you go back to, I'm human, you know, mm. we're here for a human experience. And that's not to negate the spiritual side of things and understand that we're all interconnected. And I've had some incredible experiences during breath work, especially holotropic breath work, which is the most psychedelic type of breath work, mm. supposedly, where you, again, appreciate that we're all connected and everyone else's pain is also my pain, whether I realize it or not as a human being. Can you just briefly explain for people who don't, who are not familiar, what's holotropic yeah. breath work? So holotropic breath work, um, the either, this is how they actually describe it. You're breathing a little bit deeper and a little bit quicker than what you normally would be, but you're doing that in a group setting. Okay. You're doing that with very loud music and you're doing it for two and a half hours. Oh, wow. So it was created by Stan Lof Groff, who was a big psychedelic researcher, I think, and maybe in the 70s or something like that in America. And when psychedelic research got um, squashed, if that's even a word, got sort of shut down, he wanted something to create the psychedelic experience. And that's how holotropic breathwork came into experience. So the idea is um, it's a day long event that I did. You you breathe in the morning and you're what they call a sitter in the afternoon so you basically you're there for someone when they're doing their holotropic breath session because stuff comes up um so going to this idea of the experience i had when i was breathing and i had someone sitting there next to me because you're blindfolded so to speak you've got an eye mask on so if okay. you need to go to the toilet for example they will escort you because they encourage you to keep your eye mask on throughout the two and a half hours so they're there if you need a tissue because you're crying and stuff like that um but one of the other breathers was an old lady who and i don't really know anything about her story but she had a really challenging two and a half hours she was screaming um there was obviously a really tough time that she was having it was actually her th third holotropic session so she knew what was coming she mentioned that afterwards 
Um, and it was really helping her within her healing um, because she was obviously dealing with what I can only imagine was some form of trauma, maybe that she was sort of working her way through basically. But when I was breathing and, and, and clearly entering this kind of slightly altered state of conscious and, and listening to her, I just broke down crying ultimately because I felt so connected to her pain. It, and there was this kind of realization that, you know, going back to what we mentioned earlier, we're all connected. Mm. You know, we are, there is this kind of, I think it was Carl Jung who talked about the, um, the unconscious collective. You know, there's this energetic state that we are all tapped into to different levels based, I guess, on the spiritual depth that we've gone to ultimately. Um, and these kind of states, I think, can really sh- sh- sort of show us the depth at which we are connected. Um, and I felt like I felt her pain. Um, and something I said to Martin, the, the synthesis retreat co-founder, was those experiences for me were my by far the most important part. And what I mean by that is the group um, experience. You know, doing it on your own can be very powerful, but sharing the experience with others and being vulnerable and kind of showing up as your true self and and just being vulnerable. Uh, for me, that's where the true healing kind of takes place. You can take away the plant medicine. You can do that with your breath work and other modalities ultimately, but sitting around in a circle and giving someone the time to share with you their experience, their challenges, what's come up for them, allowing them the space, however big and long that needs to be to just get out what needs to get out. That's, um, that's kind of where the magic happens. Mm. And I think that's thinking about my dream vision of where I want my life to go is I would love to get to a point where I have the skill set and the confidence and the experience to, to facilitate some of those sorts of experiences because I think that's part of life. You know, I think we're missing that in the modern world, that connection, Definitely. those smaller circles of trust and sacred spaces where we can work through this stuff because there's no denying that the world is a very challenging place these days and it's, it's changing quicker than it ever has. So we, I think we need these spaces more than ever to, to work through that stuff ultimately. Definitely. And I think that vulnerability, like if you look at Brene Brown's, what I've been reading one of her books recently, mm. it's so important. But I find as well, there's a few things that I thought there that come up. There's one thing I want to share before, because you were talking about the psychedelic experience. If we go back a little bit and mm. about how you felt in the cosmos and this altered state, there's an amazing TED talk. I don't know if you've seen, I forget the name of the lady about her. She's a brain scientist and it's her experience having a stroke. And she has this hemorrhage on the left side of the brain yeah, but years ago in 1996. And then it takes her eight years to recover. But she um, really describes what happens. So she completely loses the left brain as this hemorrhage is happening. And it's kind of getting bigger and bigger. And uh, initially, she's like, wow, this is cool. I'm a brain scientist having this experience. She moves completely into the right brain. And she can no longer, that's what I was asking you earlier, can you feel your where your hands are and she can't and she has to get help and it's extraordinarily difficult it becomes quite scary but she has this really altered experience where she's completely out of her body and just in the right side and it's absolutely um fascinating wow. Re- really good watch ted talk i'll look it out and i'll put it in the show notes and i'll send you. it to you because it's really interesting um and the other thing i was thinking as you were talking there is that I always think, I, I think having had three children or have, have got three children, that we learn more from our children than they learn from us. <laughs> and I'm definitely learning masses as a parent. And one of the things I've really noticed is they say that until about the age of seven, children are in this more theta or theta brainwave state. And you can see it because it's quite magical. And initially when they're babies, you see them kind of looking up and almost looking. I remember my eldest looking and you could see him on the baby monitor and he's just lying in his cot working out that his hand is part of his body. You know, (laughs) it's like amazing. And there's the world slows down when you're with very young children. Um, And even with my my daughter, who's the youngest, just the magical world of fairies and mermaids Mm -hmm. and going into the woods and spotting fairies she's like did you see that fairy and they just when she was very young you know and you can kind of enter it but then as they get seven or eight this shift comes and it's quite a rude awakening because they their brainwaves change 
And suddenly they become aware of anxiety. They become aware of threat. They become a little bit more nervous. Hmm. Um, and it's just, it's really interesting to watch because effectively what we're trying to do when we get into those meditative and breathwork practices, right, is access those brainwave states, which hmm. inherently as a child you had, you know, when they say when you're born, you're, you're that perfect image. Um, and we're just trying to get back there, I think. Yeah. And um, it's really interesting because I found that parenting children, you can tell them don't do this or do this. I've actually found that when you kind of go in it from that more connection and growth and contribution and almost this um, spiritual experience, they respond better to parenting. So, for example, like uh, my middle one, he's 11. We've been I was saying to him recently, you know, I think that the best thing you can do is to leave every experience that you have better than you found it. And so now he clears his plate away. And he comes up to me if he ever has he doesn't really often drink juice but if he ever has a glass of juice he'd be like i rinsed out the juice because it would leave a film or he'll wipe down where he had breakfast whereas if i'd said can you clear your plates away and put them in the dishwasher please and he said i really like what you said mummy i want to leave it better than i found it yeah. and then we've kind of moved on from there and i say to him well what about now if you could leave every person better than you found them so how would that look like you know even yeah. someone you see on the street could you smile at them and they'll smile back. But even if they don't, maybe you've touched their day in some magical way. Mm -hmm. And it's weird what you were saying there, because I think the world needs more of this right now is just bring, we've had this huge disruption, haven't we, with COVID, where we, we can't even do group breath, breath work classes because we can't breathe right. on each other for fear of infection. But I hope that we'll come full circle because I think that it's through that connection in society that on a planetary base, that's how we're going to kind of succeed Definitely. in the future. Yeah. It is. I think um, it's going to be really interesting over the next couple of years to see how how lockdown has impacted everyone because there's definitely there's definitely you know I've got a colleague who even used the term sort of PTSD some of his clients around sort of lockdown and what's going on. It's been such a huge disruption, and I, I agree. I think that connection and that intimacy it's it's the most healing thing we have to the point where actually I think you know not that I've done it properly, but if I did an audit of my clients over the years. I do wonder whether you would, could see some correlations between those who are more basically more isolated and those who are in a, a sort of a strong family unit in regards to kind of success rates and healing, um, mm. because it's just that potent. And the research is overwhelmingly clear on that. In terms of like that sense of well-being, right? And I guess it can't stop you from getting ill. But if you've got that community, as you say, you can exactly. heal better. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Um, what we didn't touch on, uh, and, and maybe this will be another time, was the whole gut health and kind of psychobiotics. But I'm guessing that's an area on its own. Um, yeah, I, that's probably an area on its own, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, yeah, something at a later date. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all of that. Thank it you. Was, I hope it made sense. <laughs> it did. It did. And it was super, super interesting. And to hear the work that you've um that you've done and are doing so what um before you go what does the future look like for you now alex obviously your breath work you're going to be training in that are you is there a specific modality that you're looking at or no i want to um i want to dabble in lots so i don't think at this point in time i'm going to do any specific one i'm going to do i'm going to try and do almost kind of the the first module or the first course of different modalities um, to begin with, to get sort of a broad range of techniques that could be used. Um, and then I'll see whether I want to, based on that experience, dive into one deeper. But I think to begin with, the idea of, I think I think they call Dan Brule, who's one of the world leading breath workers, they call him like the Jackie Chan of breath work, um, or no, the Bruce Lee of breath work. Um, so I, I think that idea of, you know, getting as many different uh, modalities and techniques under the belt to begin with. It's a little bit like functional medicine, I guess. You know, mm. you need that breadth of knowledge when it comes to physical health and medicine before you start to specialize in whatever you're going to specialize in. Um, I think it's probably the same with most things ultimately. So, yeah, that's my plan there. Um, and then we'll see. We'll kind of, you know, I came out of synthesis. I started looking at psychotherapy degrees and qualifications because the dream vision and this is probably more like a 10-year vision ultimately is when when psychedelics become legalized within the uk 
I would love to be at the forefront of that ultimately if I can, you know, and do what they call sort of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, where you're using plant medicine alongside psychotherapy to support people's healing and growth. Mm. Um, so that's like the, the dream. That's the dream. Um, and do you think they will become legalized? Yeah, I, I think it's time. You know, I've heard mm. some researchers um, talk about this and it, it really is, unless I think maybe something quite, bad happens you know synthesis talk about the fact that at the moment they have a pretty stringent screening process because obviously they're mindful that if something i put it in common sort of bad happens it's kind of tarnishing all the amazing research that is being done at this point in time so i think we you know we need to be mindful of how it's pushed forwards and we don't get a a reenactment of the 70s where it all kind of just got completely shut down because of the sort of counterculture movement and things like this um so i think it's time and the research is just so exciting in regards mm -hmm. to some of these conditions but then you've also got this idea of um i think it was michael pollan who used the term uh, something like bettering the well i've got that a little bit wrong but this idea of you know healthy individuals using psychedelics for growth and to improve further from a, a you know a healthy baseline so it's not just people with PTSD or depression, anxiety, addiction, et cetera, that can benefit from this. Humanity, we know, can benefit from this. Um, and you it's can just, just feel so much more, right? Because yeah. what I noticed is as someone who's been through, you know, the other side of the coin, who's had treatment for clinical depression, which actually becomes harder and harder to treat. So it started with me postnatally and then, and then graduated. And I think because the mind slipped into that groove, it was more difficult to treat successively after each child. And, you know, it was after my third that I ended up with this very long battle and ended up on bipolar medication. And what happens really is those drugs and, you know, I was on different two types of different medication morning and evening. They saved my life. So there's no doubt at that point. Right. I mm -hmm. couldn't do. And I don't think you should take them without doing the inner work. I think that's really important. They're there, in my view, to facilitate the work. But what they're not doing is opening you up to feeling as psychedelics are. They are actually blunting what you don't want to feel. And then eventually people sometimes say to me, how do you know when time to come off them? Right. And you absolutely have to consult your medical practitioner on that. But for me, what happened was where they had elevated my mood to a point that I was coping eventually you come to the point where you can't feel at all anymore. So the experience is very different. It's the opposite to what mm. you're describing. Suddenly you don't even see the swings. So you can't, you may not feel depressed, but you can't appreciate the highs either. Right. And so that's when I realized that actually my internal um, physio or whatever you call it, physiology and neuro psychology had changed that I no longer needed those but coming off them is very very difficult because you you trip into depression and you've got to not to the same degree but you have to experience that and it's a very slow process and be okay with that experience to ultimately come out the other end and then be able to really feel again um, whereas psychedelics actually are enhancing feelings aren't they yeah you no that's to access Exactly. It's a very important point and very well said. Ultimately, it is the opening up of emotions and trauma. So um, it's the exact opposite of some of these other medications, which are very suppressing and numbing. And that's why they're so powerful. Uh, but it's also why they can be really challenging when you're going through those sort of experiences and ceremonies and why doing it in a safe space with experienced facilitators who can guide you if you do have a challenging experience is just so important so um one thing we didn't touch on that i'll just mention quickly people will be familiar with this if they have any um knowledge of psychedelics is just the idea of set and setting so you know your mindset going into the ceremony and the actual physical environmental setting that you do it in those seem to be the most important things that will facilitate a sort of a, a positive so to speak rather than maybe a slightly more challenging experience um, and again this is why doing it in those sorts of um professional settings i think especially for for newbies like i was i think can be a really helpful way to ensure that goes smoothly and somewhere as you say where it's legal so that you know you're in <laughs> yeah, that safe place exactly <laughs> otherwise yeah. you're going to trip out on this <laughs> <laughs> this scary experience that the police are hunting you maybe it won't be lizards <laughs> yeah. it'll be <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> people with guns or something like that but <laughs> 
Well, where can people find you, Alex? Because it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. We've kind of gone into so many different things, but please share yeah, where people can fun. find more about you. Uh, so people can find me, I guess, primarily on Instagram. Um, and I'm just um, Alexander Manos on there. Um, I'm Alex Manos Health and Performance on Facebook. Um, my website is alexmanos.co.uk. Um, and I've got a podcast, which is just the Alex Manos podcast. Um, and I think that's everywhere, really. Brilliant. I will link to all of that in the show notes and also many of the other resources that you've uh, shared. Quite a few. Um, I think you've kind of given us a good reading list there, actually. Yeah, I have a tendency so, to, to, to do to that. that. <laughs> um, amazing. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you for having me on, Angela. Thanks for listening. Remember to review and subscribe. You can grab the show notes, the resources and highlights of everything Angela mentioned over at AngelaFosterPerformance.com. You can also snatch up plenty of other goodies, including the highly helpful Angela Recommends page, which is a list of everything she personally recommends to optimize your mind, body and lifestyle.